Good morning and welcome to Duck Church. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor here. And, uh, you know, there are so many uncertain things in our world right now. It seems like the only thing that doesn't change is change. <laughs> Confronted with these realities, Hebrews 12, 28 says this. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Through our faith in Jesus Christ, we are established on a firm foundation, a foundation upon which we can build our lives, a foundation that remains steadfast and strong even though our circumstances may change. Thanks be to God. Right now, if you will look in your bulletin, you'll find a connection card. It looks like this one. And if you would take a moment to complete as much information as you feel comfortable in sharing on the front of that, it does help us to know you a little better and how we might better serve you or pray for you uh, or pray with you if you share a request with us. Um, and uh, if you are with us for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. Maybe you're coming back for another time. Uh, if you would check the appropriate box on the left side on the front, that would help us out a lot. Now, I just want to draw attention that there is a back side to the uh, connection card. Uh, we call these next steps, and they're designed to help us to take what we believe and put them into practice in our lives where they can bear fruit for our benefit and for the glory of God. We'll talk about those briefly at the conclusion of the message, so hang on to the connection card. We're going to give you some time a little later in the service to complete anything you need to finish up. And um, we'll take them up toward the end of our time together this morning. So speaking of this morning, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. And the message is, Nearer my God to Thee. Erwin Lutzer had this to say about forgiveness. He said, Forgiveness is always free, but that doesn't mean that confession is always easy. Sometimes it's hard, incredibly hard. It is painful to admit our sins and entrust ourselves to God's care. Friends, even though it is difficult, it is necessary in order for us to progress in our faith. And I want to say that everyone is welcome here in the Duck Church family where we gather to celebrate today God's promise of restoration and forgiveness. So let's get things started with our call to worship. You'll find that printed in your bulletin and let's stand together. But the time is coming indeed, it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father who is looking for those who will worship him that way. Friends, let's uh, lift our voices together as we sing our first hymn, Amazing Grace, number 572 in your hymnal.
may be seated. If we ask God to restore us to the way that we've been, then we have not asked of God what he intends to give. God is not content simply to return or to restore us to former things. With confidence in God's generosity, we confess our sins with the new life that Jesus offers us. Would you pray with me the prayer of confession you'll find in your bulletin? Oh Lord, you have examined our hearts and know everything about us. You know when we sit down or stand up. You know our thoughts from afar. You see when we walk or lie down. You know every detail of our conduct. You even know what we are going to say before we say it. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us, too great for us to understand. Cleanse us from hidden faults. Keep us from deliberate sins. Don't let them control us. Then we will be free of guilt and innocent of serious wrongdoing. Listen to the promise of God. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them and show them my saving power. Friends, as we come to our time for prayer this morning, uh, we want to lift up prayers for Lois Green. Lois is uh, in the hospital at Chesapeake Regional with uh, pneumonia, and we also add Rich to our prayers as well. And also prayers for Gail Harris as she's approaching her uh, date for her kidney transplant. Um, my um, sister-in-law, Jennifer Eidlett, who is dealing with a recurrence of breast cancer. Uh, we also want to remember all of those that are the victims of war across the planet. And uh, I wonder if there are others that we should pray about together. Yes? Tony and Susan Shiano. Yes? You and Angie on your anniversary. Yes, we got an anniversary coming up this Wednesday. Thank you. Yes, Sally and Julia. Yes. The entire Brown family is sick. So we pray for all of them. Okay, Brown family. Yes. David and Carol. David and Carol. Oh, yep. Alex and Ingrid. Yes, Larry. Anyone else? Oh, yep. Hilda. Benton Mitchell. Benton Mitchell. That's Roland Twyford. Yep. Anyone else? All right. Let's uh, go before the Lord then as we pray together. Father, we come with joy when we think about gathering here to worship you. It's the first day of the week, and we want to begin our week on the right foot, and so we we set aside everything else and we make time for this to come and to honor you for who you are and for all you've done. We thank you today for new beginnings, for fresh starts, and we all are in need of those. And 
Uh, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love today. And today, as we focus on Isaiah, we particularly thank you for forgiveness and restoration. And I pray that you would help us to be attuned to what you would say to us as we listen to your word read and proclaimed. Father, as we gather in this place, we are grateful that you are God. You are not a concept. You are not some ancient theology. You are Emmanuel, God present in our midst. And not just because we've gathered here in this place, but every Christian, you indwell by your Holy Spirit. And sometimes when we get out in the world, it seems like we're all on our own. Challenges confront us and uh, crises uh, catch up to us. And it seems like we're battling on our own, but that's not the truth because you are always with us. You've promised you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. And for that, we give you thanks. And today, as we gather together the prayers that we have called aloud and for those that we would rather not call aloud, uh, we gratefully entrust them to you because we have come to know you as a God who is compassionate, a God who uh, is able and willing. And uh, certainly you can do things that we cannot do for ourselves or for, for others. And so we come bearing these uh, requests for prayer this morning, thanking you that we can offer them to you. We're also thankful as we offer them to look back on the track record of your impeccable track record of answering prayer. It's not always in the way that we want it sometimes, but you're always faithful. And so we pray that you would be faithful to those that we pray for today and faithful to us as you always are. Help us to find strength and hope and care in you. Lord, we pray for this church. We pray for all of the churches here on the Outer Banks. We pray that you would um, empower us to serve in your holy name and to offer to the world a helping hand and the love of Christ. We ask all these blessings, submitting them to your perfect and holy will. And we pray as Jesus would teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
friends, I want to uh, share with you uh, briefly about a brand new ministry that our church is embarking on this summer. In fact, I'm not going to share so much. I'm going to let the, uh, the video speak for itself. But this is a backstory about how God is moving in our church. So let's give our attention to the screen. I'm John Minnick, and my wife and I are well, we're both members of the church and, and local business owners together in our business here in Duck. And uh, prior to our finance committee meeting that we had a few months ago, I had been talking to one of our managers about his issues with childcare in the summer. Uh, it's our busiest time of year. Uh, it's a time when his requirements to be at work are at the, their peak. And he doesn't really have anywhere without school for his kids to be. And that's a problem that's been in existence here on the Outer Banks for a long time. When we were younger, we faced the same challenge and parents end up doing extraordinary things to try to get somebody to take care of their kids and the camps sell out really quick and all those things happen. So we had just had this conversation and then we're sitting in a finance committee meeting and we're talking about what can we do to help the church reach out to the community and have an impact and show them God's love. And God just put all those pieces together for me in an instant and it was not an idea that I had ever really previously thought of, but I was like, well, shoot, I mean, we could have a camp here for kids who, you know, pay, who have parents who drive past our church every morning uh, on their way to work. And if we could use our resources that we've been so generously given to make it affordable for them, it would be a way for us to really touch people with uh, God's love. Brooke and I am the director of family ministries here at Duck Church. I'm also a parent and I'm very involved in my children's school. This is a concern I've heard many times before and it kind of felt like God was leading Duck Church to become part of the solution. So we started exploring what that might look like and everything just came together so easily. And that's how we created Duck Church Day Camp. It is a safe, affordable, all day camp for six to 12 year olds and Jesus is gonna be there. During the week, we're going to be having a lot of fun. We've got some great field trips planned, and then we're also going to be focusing on teaching our kids what it looks like to serve like Jesus. And so one of the ways that we're going to do that is we're going to share with them stories of orphans who are sponsored through the Zoe ministry, which is a ministry that helps empower children who are in extreme poverty to overcome that poverty. We're going to give the kids some opportunities to raise money for these orphans. Our goal is to sponsor three of them. And one of the ways you can help with that is we're going to be having a car wash on the Wednesday of that week to help us raise some of those funds. We've gone on faith and God has provided the kids. Registration is almost full. God has given us this incredible opportunity to meet a real need in our community. And we would love for you to join us on this adventure. If you would like to help out in any way, we've got spaces where people can help for the whole week, for partial days, for just an activity one day. Any way, we would love for you to join us in what the Holy Spirit is doing among us. We really believe this is the leading of the Holy Spirit. I just think it's so incredible that, you know, a conversation at work, uh, God planted something in John's brain. He shared it. Everybody immediately caught on to the vision. And here we are, as Brooke said, it's almost completely full. It's our first time ever doing anything like this. And we are super excited. I mean, where can you get childcare for $75 for the whole week? And they're going to be doing all kinds of fun things. So um, I, I just uh, love it when a plan comes together. And God is uh, excellent at doing that. All right, friends, let me invite you to stand. We're going to sing our next psalm, My Hope is Built. It's on page 102.
friends, as you put your hymnals away, but before you're seated, would you find somebody in here that you don't know yet, introduce yourself and share the peace of Christ? friends. You know, we here at Duck Church believe it's important for us to profess our beliefs. And so the Apostles' Creed is printed in your bulletin for your convenience. Let's proclaim what it is we believe as followers of Jesus. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we turn our focus now on God's word, I want to say that I believe with all my heart that this is the Holy Spirit inspired word of God, which proclaims God's love, God's forgiveness, hope, and his uh, ever being present with us, to us and to all of humanity. Today, as we focus on God's restoration and forgiveness, let's be attentive as God's word is read, so that we might receive all that God has for us this morning. Listen for the word of God. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I form for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. 
You have not brought any fragrant calamus for me or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Would you pray with me? Father, as we read this passage of Scripture, show us your truth and what you want us to learn. Pinpoint the things in our thinking and our lives that aren't right. Help us to remember that your word is life and always true. Use the truth of your word to transform our faith and let our faith guide our actions. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the years that I have been in ministry, I've come to know a number of people whose lives have been destroyed by sin. I think of a young accountant who was doing quite well for himself, earning a six-figure income at a big, prestigious, uh, big eight accounting firm. One morning, he came to his office to find federal agents waiting for him. He had been caught in bezeling. He lost his job, his home, his family, and is currently in jail. I think of a man that I went to seminary with. Actually, unfortunately, it was more than one, but this particular one, he was an associate pastor of the largest church in his community, had served there for several years and enjoyed the respect and influence that comes with such a position. The next thing I know, he's caught having an affair with another woman. He resigned from the church, surrendered his credentials, and got a job selling copying machines. And I wish I could say that were the only case I knew of, but it's not. I think of high-ranking politicians over the years whose career and lives were ruined by sexual scandal, or Wall Street executives whose greed was the motivation behind insider trading schemes that landed them in federal prison. And we can add a generous number of sports figures and celebrities who have fallen from favor. These are the kinds of sins that make headlines, and it's easy for us to see how these big sins can ruin one's life. But you know what? The sins we commit that aren't worthy of headlines also have the power to ruin our lives. And many have discovered that. Perhaps you learn firsthand how pride or selfishness or greed or jealousy or hostility or laziness or dishonesty and so on can sabotage a career, a relationship, a life. These kinds of sins aren't reported in the tabloids, but they can be every bit as devastating. And I'm sure some of you here today feel as if sin has ruined your life. Maybe you were unfaithful and it cost you your marriage. Maybe you were dishonest and it cost you your job. Maybe you were disobedient and it cost you the opportunity to be used by God. And maybe when you look at your life today, you see nothing but the results of sin. And it all seems so hopeless. If so, this message is especially for you today. If your life has been ruined by sin, the word of God offers you hope to hang on to. God's word tells us that what we have ruined, God restores. There is hope for those whose lives have been ruined by sin. Today, we're focusing on a passage uh, of scripture from Isaiah. Isaiah is hands down one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. Anyone who says that the God of the Old Testament is angry and vindictive has not read the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is all about God's mercy. And in our passage today from Isaiah 43, Isaiah shows us that even when your life has been ruined by sin, God can restore you. And there are four aspects of this process of restoration that we're going to look at today, and each of these is crucial to getting on with your life. First of all, you must face up to your sin. I want to make something crystal clear. You cannot gloss over sin. You can't pretend it doesn't exist 
or that it doesn't destroy. Sin breaks the heart of God. It goes against everything that God stands for and everything that God wants for us. God doesn't just turn his back and ignore it. It's an issue that must be dealt with. In verses 21 through 24, God is specific about how his people have sinned against him. He says, you haven't been obedient. You haven't called on me. You haven't worshiped me or honored me. You haven't made sacrifices to me. And then in verse 24, he says, but you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. And this verse tells us some important things. It tells us that sin not only hurts us, it hurts God. Our sins burden God and they make him weary. They hurt him. And this verse also reminds us that when we sin, we are doing more than just bending the rules or breaking society's moral code. We are offending God. Sin is first and foremost an act of rebellion against God. King David recognized this after committing the sin of adultery with Bathsheba and after having her husband Uriah murdered, he repented and he said to God in Psalm 51, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Sin can destroy a friendship. It can destroy a marriage. It can destroy a career, a life. A ministry. But we must realize that the real damage caused by sin is that it creates separation between you and God. You have to face up to your sin. You have to recognize that sin is responsible for the pain in your life. And for some of you, it's an easy step to take because the results of your sin are so obvious to you. But you also have to face up to the fact that sin not only hurts you, it hurts God. It goes against everything God wants for you. So sin is more than a personal inconvenience in our lives. It is an obstacle to our relationship with God. After facing up to your sin, second, trust God to forgive your sins. You know, a difficult lesson that we must learn is that we are absolutely, totally, and completely unable to pay the price for our own sins. Now, in our society, we have the idea of justice that works on a limited basis. For example, if you rob a bank, I wouldn't recommend it, uh, you pay your debt to society by serving time in prison. And of course, if you ask anyone who's been to prison, they will tell you that even after they served their time, the debt wasn't really paid in full. The stigma of having been in jail follows them for the rest of their life. You may serve your debt to society, but society never forgets the debt. There's an old Humphrey Bogart movie called Invisible Stripes about an ex-con trying to make it on the outside, but everything seems to be stacked against him. He's wearing invisible stripes and no matter what he does, they'll never disappear. Well, we wear stripes too. No matter how hard we try, we cannot pay for our own sins. You can't unrob a bank. You can't undo an affair. You can't unsay hateful words. Once milk is spilt, you can't unspill it. There's no way that we can do anything to pay for our own sins. However, God has a plan with dealing with our sin. He doesn't ignore it. He forgives it. God forgives it and then he forgets it. Listen to what God says. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers them no more. A couple important phrases in this verse that I want to point out. First, he says, I forgive you for my own sake. God doesn't forgive you for who you are. God forgives you because of who he is. You may not think that you deserve forgiveness, and from a human standpoint, you may be right, but God doesn't forgive from a human standpoint. His forgiveness isn't based on how much you deserve it. God's forgiveness is based on his character, not yours. When you sin and you ask God for forgiveness, God forgives, period. Why does he do it? 
He does it for his own sake because God wants to be in loving relationship with you. He wants you to know him with all your mind and to love him with all your heart. And he won't let anything stand in the way of that, not even your own foolish disobedience. Though your sins hurt him, God forgives you anyway. Also, God says, I remember them no more. In order to help us understand this phrase completely, I did an exhaustive study of each word in the original Hebrew, checking and rechecking the syntax and researching each verb tense. And it shed amazing light on this verse. In the original Hebrew, the phrase, I remember them no more, literally means, I remember them no more. <laughs> God forgets about our sin. Now, in this sense, God forgives in a way that is entirely impossible for humans to do. We cannot choose to forget. I mean, we forget things accidentally, but if we try to forget something, we can't. It's beyond our power to forget on purpose. But it's not beyond God's power. He can choose to remember our sins no more, and that's exactly what God does. When God forgives... God forgets. If your life has been ruined by sin, you can't restore it yourself. You can't pay your own debt. You must turn to God for forgiveness and let him restore your life. The third step is let go of the past. And friends, this is the step where we drop the ball all too often. God forgets the past but we refuse to. We relive it day after day. We remind ourselves how terrible we are and what awful things we have done. And as a result, like Humphrey Bogart, we go through life wearing invisible stripes and we allow them to hold us back. We tell ourselves, I can't be in a relationship now because I failed in the past. I can't be a godly parent now because I failed in the past or grandparent because I failed as a parent. I can't achieve anything in my career now because I failed in the past. I can't be used by God now because I failed in the past. If the Bible teaches us anything at all, it teaches us that the past does not equal the future. The change you think are holding you back don't really exist. God has forgiven you. Don't be a prisoner to the past. Let go of it. God has forgiven you. And not only has he forgiven you, he has commanded you, forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. What happened yesterday happened yesterday. It's old news. And as far as God is concerned, it's no longer an issue. You can forget about it because God forgot about it a long time ago. And it becomes easier to let go of the past if you'll also do the fourth thing we see in this passage. Concentrate on what God is doing in your life today and tomorrow. When you examine the life of Christ, you see how Jesus related to people and something quickly becomes obvious. Jesus cares more about your future than he does about your past. There's a story in the New Testament, you're probably familiar about it, uh, about a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a Jew, but he was despised by other Jews. He had built a personal fortune by extorting exorbitant taxes from his own countrymen and then skimming off the top for himself. And when he heard that Jesus was coming to town, he desperately wanted to see him. But Zacchaeus was short, and so he couldn't see over the crowd. We know from the little song. He was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And so he climbed to the top of a sycamore tree, and he waited for Jesus to pass by. When Jesus reached the spot where Zacchaeus was, he said this, Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your house today. And people criticized Jesus for eating with a sinner, but Jesus wasn't concerned about Zacchaeus' past. He was concerned about his future. That day, Zacchaeus the sinner became Zacchaeus the saint. 
He turned his back on the past and he began to concentrate on his future as a follower of Christ. And he stood before everyone that day and he said, I will give half of my fortune to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, and he had, I will pay them back four times the amount. Jesus said, this is why I have come to seek and to save the lost. Jesus knew that Zacchaeus could become an honest businessman. He knew Zacchaeus could become generous with his money. Jesus didn't allow this man's past to be an obstacle to his future. As soon as Zacchaeus was ready to forget the former things and concentrate on his future with Christ, he experienced salvation. Friends, God has plans for you that don't involve your past. He wants to do something new in your life. Listen to what he says. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And your life may seem like a desert, but God wants to transform it into an oasis. God wants to do something new in your life. And it is your job to let go of the past and concentrate on what God is doing in your life today and tomorrow. Letting go of the past. You know what that is? It's repentance. It's saying, I don't want the past to be a part of my life anymore. Concentrating on what God is doing in your life today and tomorrow. Do you know what that is? It's obedience. It's saying regardless of what has brought me to this place in my life, I will do what God is calling me to do today. If your life has been ruined by sin, God will restore you. He won't hold the hurt against you. He will forgive you for his own sake and he will forget your sin forever. God has done this through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins. You can be forgiven no matter what you've done, no matter who you've done it with. You can be forgiven, completely forgiven by the mercy of God. And that is God's promise. Now, let go of the past and concentrate on living for Christ today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that amazing grace that we've already sung about. We know that we're not deserving of your forgiveness, but thank God it's not about us deserving it. It's about your character and your desire to be in loving relationship with us. So, Lord, I pray that as we open ourselves to you, as we ask for forgiveness for our sins, that we would truly know that we have been forgiven once and for all and that you've forgotten all about it. You're not gonna dredge it back up over and over again the next time we make a mistake. Lord, help us to forgive ourselves too and help us to focus on what you're doing in our lives in this moment and for all the moments to come. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So before we receive the offering this morning, I want everybody to get your connection card back out and prayerfully consider what step you can take this week to draw closer to God. And if you are with us for the first time today, we have a gift for you. It's a little book uh, called How Good is Good Enough. It's written by Andy Stanley, and it's all about how to know for certain that you'll go to heaven one day. Duck Church wants you to be sure about that. So all you need to do is drop your completed connection card in the offering plate when it comes by in just a moment. And then as you're leaving today, on the back wall on the right side, as you're heading out of the sanctuary, there's a little table that's filled with copies of this book and they're there for you. So please pick one up, take it home and read it. Uh, it's one way we can say thank you for worshiping with us today. And you know, having been blessed by God with such an abundance, we come now to offer our gifts to support the ministries of this church with gratitude and joy in our hearts as we worship God.
Father, grateful for all that you have entrusted to our care and stewardship. We offer these gifts through your church that they might be a blessing to those in need in our community and in our world. Bless and receive these gifts we offer in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's remain standing as we sing together our closing hymn. It's found on page 602 this morning. You have longed for sweet peace.
So I want to make sure everybody knows that there are duck donuts in the fellowship hall and they're there for everybody. If you've never tried them, here's your opportunity. Uh, we're kind of bringing our Pray For Me campaign to a close. There have been a number of persons in our church who have been praying for students and college students. And uh, it's a way to, to celebrate uh, that ministry. And there's a special gift for those who have been uh, prayer champions in the fellowship hall, but everyone is welcome to donuts. So we hope that you'll stick around for that. If you're in town next weekend, and even if you're not, we're still going to celebrate Father's Day. Uh, that's next Sunday. And the scripture is going to be Genesis 48, 1 through 11. And the message will be fatherhood. I hope that you'll be able to join us. And I hope you'll invite someone to join you as we worship the Lord together. And now let's receive this blessing. May God guide you through your life. May Christ lead you into knowing him more deeply. And may the Holy Spirit fill you with faith overflowing so that you might humbly walk with God. Amen.